Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I apologize for my voice. I lost it in the flight um, to the US, so my voice is a bit unusual. Uh, but I guess that, 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 that do it for, for this afternoon. Welcome to my session. Thanks for coming. If you have attended this talk at the ELCE in Prague in uh, last October, that's going to be pretty much the same talk, so it's still time uh, for you to leave and, and attend another session. If not, then thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to be talking about BuildRoot and see what's new uh, in this project since the last few years. I work for a company called Bootlin, formerly known as Free Electrons. Uh, we recently changed our name to this uh, brand new name, Bootlin. Uh, but we're still the same company. We do um, embedded Linux uh, engineering and training, and I personally work on kernel stuff as well as build root, and I come from France. So before we um, get started, a short poll. Who already knows about build root in the room? So almost everybody. Who is already using it? Uh, like a good half of the room. Who is using OE, Yocto, another half of the room, with some intersection between the two, interestingly. Um, OpenWRT, later, or another of its, okay, a few more people. Uh, another build system, okay. What build system? Uh, okay, other people using what? Okay, um, good. So, um, for most of you, that's probably uh, something that's already known. Um, a short introduction about what BuildRoot is. It's an embedded Linux build system. So the, the point is to build from source a cross-compilation tool chain, a root file system with a number of libraries and applications, uh, all built by cross-compilation, build a kernel image and potentially bootloader images as well. Uh, one of its kind of um, uh, strong selling points is that it's uh, reasonably fast, pretty simple, and allows you to build a um, simple root file system in a matter of just a few minutes. It's easy to use and understand, and it's all based on kind of standard technologies, kconfig, like the Linux kernel for defining the configuration, and based on make files for actually describing what the build is going to do. It easily allows to generate small root file systems. The default uh, root file system that it builds is just two megs, so then you can add up more libraries, more application, but at least the baseline is, is already small. And you can optimize that further down if you need, but it's kind of a reasonable baseline. We've got more than 2,300 packages, and, and that's growing pretty much every day. Um, we generate file system images and not the distribution, so it's kind of um, one of the, um, the big difference with OE, Yocto. Uh, which builds a distribution with binary packages. We don't do that in BuildRoot. We build just a root file system image that kind of fixed in stone, and if you want to uh, build a new version of it, you just have to rerun the tool to rebuild a new image. So we don't have any package management system integrated. Uh, it's a vendor neutral uh, project. It's uh, like fully open source, number, uh, number of contributors coming from different companies, hobbyists. Um, it's oh, yeah, um, completely independent from any uh, specific company. Uh, the community is pretty active, and I, I'll have a bunch of slides about that um, in, in, a few, in a few slides. We ship stable releases every three months, and I talk more about the release schedule because there have been some um, changes and improvements recently. And it started in 2001, which means it's probably the oldest still maintained build system. I'm not sure, so I'm going to say, say maybe, but I think it's uh, the um, oldest still maintained build system. So um, I gave this talk uh, four years ago here at ELC, um, so, which was what's new. So it's been uh, four years, and um, I thought it was uh, time to uh, kind of refresh uh, the people who were interested in BuildRoot. And a number of things have changed. So we'll talk about the activity of the project, the release schedule, um, the architecture support, toolchain support, a number of infrastructure improvement in the project, testing improvements, and a, a bunch of other uh, details. Um, so the um, activity of the project is shown um, on, on when that, that first slide, the uh, per commit uh, activity per release. So we've got approximately 1,000 to 1,500 commits per release, and we ship one release every three months. So it's, and it's fairly stable over time with some variations, uh, but it's reasonably stable. Um, we've got about 100, 110 contributor per release. And it's also fairly stable over time. So as you can see, it has grown from the uh, 2012 years uh, all the way up to now. And it, we've reached kind of a, a fairly stable point. 
Uh, the mailing list is fairly active as well with about 2K to 3K messages a month on the mailing list, so it's uh, pretty active. And the number of packages, as I've said, have, has grown over time, so we're now up to 2,300 packages uh, integrated. Um, and as I said, every day people are contributing more and more packages to uh, uh, suit their own specific needs. In terms of release schedule, um, um, the, the basic things haven't changed much over the last years. Uh, we still do one release every three months, so we've got one release in February, in May, in August, and in October. And we never skip the release or miss the release date, or, well, maybe by like two or three days, something like that. Um, but not much more than that, so it's a pretty uh, impressive achievement. Uh, and we'll be celebrating next year the, the, the 10 years of the, that release cycle, because that started in 2009. Uh, 2009-02 was our first uh, stable release. Um, the, the, the change that was made last year is to introduce the, the concept for a release maintained for a longer period of time. So until 2017-02, uh, we are not doing any uh, really serious maintenance on past releases. So as soon as a new release was up, um, that was the one you had to use if you wanted to have any sort of support. Um, we were simply dropping support for any past release. Uh, so in since uh, 2017 02, we decided to have one, uh, so LTS, so long term, is a maybe a little bit of a stretch here because we are uh, only a one year maintenance period, but it's still better than just three months. So 2017 02 has been maintained for a year, so until uh, 2018 02, that's been released just um, uh, two weeks ago or something like that. Um, and uh, we will do that every year. So uh, now that 2018-02 has been released, we've stopped the maintenance of 2017-02, uh, and we've started the maintenance of 2018-02 uh, for one year, until 2019-02, obviously. So for 2017-02, we made 10 point releases, so almost every month there has been a point release integrating uh, mainly security fixes and bug fixes. So we try to avoid upgrading packages, to avoid breaking people having existing systems. The idea is just to backport um, uh, security fixes or build fixes or uh, fixes to license information, other things that, that uh, should normally not break things for, for users. So we've had about almost 800 commits in this, in this branch that um, has stopped to be maintained uh, two weeks ago and we've started doing that on the new release. So that's something we're we will be trying to do um, uh, moving forward, and we hope that uh, uh, users will help in this uh, will help us in this effort by reporting the issues that they have faced if they are using the uh, the maintained uh, branch. So if you are using Buildroot and not upgrading on a three months um, uh, rhythm, I uh, would encourage you to pick one of the O2 release so that you join this like uh, more long-term maintenance effort, and so you can also plan on a yearly updates of your uh, build root um, infrastructure. So that's, I think, um, the, the, um, one of the big uh, change that, that occurred last year. Um, in terms of maintenance, uh, we used to have that uh, single committer project maintainer uh, model, um, a little bit like the Linux kernel, but of course to a different scale. Uh, we now added two additional committers that have the, the same, like I would say, power, uh, just three people that can commit to the, uh, the official repo. So um, I've been part of this, uh, this team of uh, three people. And that has helped um, um, integrate more patches and review more work and, and get more stuff merged uh, in, in a more reasonable time frame. We still do physical meetings, so every uh, two, uh, if twice a year we have a meeting, um, in, uh, one at ELCE and one at FOSDEM, so it's a very European-centric, uh, but maybe one day in, in the US. And we also have uh, once in a while some more private hackathons with just uh, part of the core team while the meetings at ELCE and, and FOSDEM are more like publicly open to um, anyone who wants to participate to, to that. So that's a picture from um, the meeting at FOSDEM in Brussels last month. And we had, uh, I think, 14 participants, which was um, uh, nice uh, and, and really allowed to make progress on a number of topics. Um, speaking of uh, architecture support, um, we uh, are probably the build system supporting, so I'm not sure what you're um, seeing here, probably the build system supporting the largest number of architectures. Are you seeing just the full slide or just, um, I'm not sure what you're seeing right now. 
Let me let me check. Yeah, you have the full slide. Okay. Um, so probably one of the build systems with the largest number of uh, architecture supported. Uh, we've got the, the, the big ones and obvious ones like Intel and ARM and stuff like that, but also more uh, specific CPU architecture, all the ones like M68K or um, um, FPGA-based CPU architectures like Microblaze or uh, NIOS2. Uh, yes? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, there's been discussions, well, not really discussions, but people like talking about, hey, it would be nice to add support for RISC-V. Uh, we were kind of waiting for the support for it to land upstream in GCC and Binatils and the Candle and GLPC, and that has happened, uh, which now paves the way for, for uh, adding support for RISC-V. So it's just a matter of someone um, being sufficiently motivated to do the few patches that are required. It's, it's very limited, the, amount, the effort that is needed to add support for a new architecture. Um, I think the, um, the, main, um, um, the main effort is not actually introducing the architecture, but maintaining it over the long run. And we'll see that we do a, um, um, a quite, quite some amount of, of uh, build testing, and that is the thing that, that takes the, the, the biggest amount of time to, uh, to take care of when you maintain a, a CPU architecture and build with that. I'll get back, back to that. But yes, RISV is definitely on, on, on the radar at some point. Yeah, yeah, uh, th and thanks for doing it, yeah. Um, so what we've done in terms of CPU uh, architecture improvements over the last year is, um, uh, is mentioned here. So we've got no MMU ARM support, so people doing M3, M4, and I should mention M7 has been added recently as well. Uh, we've done some little bit of re reorganization around ARM, ARM64 options, so that if you have an ARM64 um, SOC but you want to build an ARM32 bit system, you can still select that it want, you want to build for, uh, let's say, Cortex A53, but still in 32 bit mode, so that's been added. We've got a lot of uh, work from IBM done on uh, PPC64, um, Big Indian and Little Indian support, so it's, it's nice to see contributions from the, um, uh, the manufacturer directly. Uh, MIPS has been improved quite, uh, quite a bit as well from Imaginations but activity has reduced uh, recently due to, um, obviously, imagination uh, changing a little bit its, its strategy. We've added OpenRISC, uh, CSKY, and Spark64 support, um, and a bunch of other uh, architectures have been improved. M68K, Blackfin, Microblaze have been improved, and we've dropped a bunch of architectures, and I think Blackfin is on, on the list for being removed as well in the near future because it's going to be dropped from the upstream channel in the, in, in the fairly um, uh, well near future. On the tool chain side, um, which is kind of an, obviously an important part for a build system, so build root support since uh, a long time, uh, two models to um, uh, provide a tool chain so it can build its own, so it's gonna build a bin cells and GCC and GLPC or whatever C library you like um, in the right order with the right dependencies, so that's what we call the internal tool chain. But it can also reuse existing uh, tool chains, that's what we call the external tool chain, so you've got your Linaro tool chain or your vendor provided tool chain for your favorite CPU architecture, you can tell uh, Peter, please use it because I trust that tool chain more than, than what you're gonna do. Uh, so you can do that. So on the internal tool chain side, we've added support for Muscle, which is um, kind of the, the, the new kid in tone in terms of uh, C libraries. Um, we've moved from UCLPC, which was uh, pretty much dead, to its fork called UCLPC NG. So it's basically the same project, but kind of uh, maintained by another person that has done lots of work to clean it up and improve the testing and, and, and merge lots of patches that were uh, um, out of tree in a number of uh, uh, build systems. Uh, we do regular updates of the toolchain components, so pretty much whenever there is a new GCC or Binitals or GB release, we have patches uh, flowing in to update to that latest uh, version. And we have a policy of using um, not the latest version, but just the one before as our default, and offer the option of using the latest one, so we can have, don't directly upgrade to the latest GCC version to give some time um, for us to test the packages and for people to also test them. So we have support for, for example, GCC 7.x, but our default is 6.x at the moment, and same for Binitals and GDB and, and so forth. So every, all of those components have been updated uh, whenever needed. We've added uh, link time optimization support and Fortran support, so that's been, um, we have sometimes surprising contributions, but it's, it's there. Um, 
we uh, used to have a, a toolchain wrapper, um, so it's basically a GCC wrapper that calls GCC, uh, that we were using only for the external toolchain, uh, which we also no use for the internal toolchain, uh, especially to check for a number of bogus flags. So if you're cross-compiling, but you're referring to libraries of your host machine, uh, or headers of your host machine, you're probably doing something wrong, so the wrapper catches that and says, ooh, something bad is, bad is happening. Uh, we've dropped eglibc because eglibc no longer exists. It's all in glibc nowadays. Um, on the external toolchain side, um, so we've done a little bit of internal reorganization in the way external toolchain have added. It used to be like one big single package ending all of the external toolchain stuff, which was pretty uh, difficult to maintain. So we split that into uh, uh, individual packages per external toolchain family. So you have uh, one package for the Linaro toolchain, one package for that other external toolchain, and so on and so forth. So we've got maybe 10 or 12 uh, external toolchain packages, so it's a little bit easier to maintain. Um, we've improved the wrapper with this um, include and library pass checking, which is also used for the internal toolchain. And we've just like internal toolchains updated uh, to newer versions of the toolchains that were available. Um, Side note, it's kind of uh, not directly built root, but related. Um, we've started this uh, toolchains.bootlin.com service that uh, provides a wide range of uh, pre-built toolchains for basically every CPU architecture that build root supports with the three variants of the C libraries. And uh, each time with a stable version, which is basically the default version of the uh, toolchain components that BuildRoot uses and including edge version, which is the latest of them. So it makes like thir uh, 34 um, CPU architecture multiplied by three C libraries. They are not all available on all CPU architectures, but when available, it's provided. Multiplied by two, one stable, one bleeding edge. So it's, uh, I think, 180 or something like that uh, pre-built toolchains that uh, we provide. And we regularly update them as, as, um, as BuildRoot updates. And all of those tool chains, we not only build them, but we, um, when we build them, we build a tool chain, then we build a minimal Linux system with a Linux kernel, minimal user space. We boot that up into, under QMU to kind of do a minimal validation that the tool chain is reasonably working. So it's not like a full test, but it's still better than nothing. And, and only if the tool chain passes all those tests, it's put up online on, on that side. So if you're looking for a pre-built tool chain that may be uh, useful, yes, please. Yeah, it is. We did support that. It's, I've been doing that for quite a while. It, it, yeah, there were there there were a few gotchas, and and then my next slide is gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but yes, those tool chains are built by Buildroot and made to be reusable by anything else. So you can reuse them as external tool chains in Buildroot, but you can also use them. I, I use them regularly for like building my own kernel or my own bootloader on the side when I do kernel work or bootloader work. Uh, so those should normally behave like any regular uh, pre-built tool chain that you can find. Um, so one of the things that we've improved and related to that is uh, relocatable SDK. So when you build build roots, you've got a bunch of folders, and uh, one of them is output host, which is where we install uh, all the native tools. So that's where you've got your cross-compiler and all uh, other tools that might have been compiled for the host machine that are necessary for the build to proceed. And it also contains the toolchain sysroot, which is where all the libraries and headers that have been cross-compiled for your target are located so that the cross-compiler can find them. And um, this basically output host folder can be used as an SDK. It has the compiler, it has all the libraries, all the headers, so you can give that to application developers and they can use it to build applications that will run on the targets that has been uh, produced by BuildRoot. But that SDK was not relocatable until now. So if you had built it on in the I don't know slash home foo build root output host, it had to be installed at that very same location, which is obviously annoying. So we fixed that up um, with a new make SDK target. So after the build is finished, you can do make SDK, and it's gonna do um, a number of things in the output, uh, replacing RPAS, generating an, a shell script, and, and and stuff like that that makes the um, SDK uh, mostly relocatable, but uh, not everything has been relocate, made relocatable, but there is a shell script uh, that is generated that people using the SDK have to run when the SDK has been installed to fix up the remaining um, absolute path. 
Um, so it's been it's quite interesting, and that's that's being used for the the tool chain uh, work, obviously, and you can also use it to uh, provide SDKs to your uh, to your users. Um, we've added uh, ashes um, to packages to um, verify downloads and verify that the, the the tarballs being downloaded, the patches being downloaded have not been modified, and also that the license files have not been modified compared to uh, what you expect. So it's basically just a very simple um, file that, that sits next to every package make file uh, that provide the hashes. Um, so the uh, tarball and patch uh, hashes are verified when you extract the tarballs and, and apply the patches. And the license file hashes are verified when you generate the licensing report. So we've got this nice make legal info target that uh, provides for you a, a manifest to help you uh, with the uh, license compliance. And as part of that, it will verify that the copying file or the license file is still the same as, as what we expect. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty nice feature, and, and almost all our packages now have ashes available. Um, and it, for example, allows us to detect that upstream sometimes re-uploads a new tarball under the same name without putting it as a new release. So the, the hash has, been, has changed, and, and, and you don't know why what has changed in, in the tarball. Um, so it's, it's a pretty nice feature. Um, so we've got um, licensing report, as I've said, it's, it's been there um, since more than four years, but we've done a bunch of improvement there. Uh, we're now using more consistently SPDX license code, so that um, all the license information is, is encoded in a more standardized format. Um, we've added ashes for license files, as I mentioned. We've added support for uh, storing the source code of binary artifacts, and that's especially used for uh, pre-built toolchain. When you download a pre-built toolchain, you download binaries. But as part of your license compliance process, you also want to ship the corresponding source code. So um, we have a, a, a new variable in, in packages where they can specify, OK, this is the binary you want to use like for the build. But for the license compliance, here is the actual source code tarball that contains all the GCC and Binitil source code so that you can provide a, um, a set of tarballs that, that meet your uh, uh, license compliance requirements. And uh, last but not least, we've added um, license details to a large number of packages, so to the point where almost all of the packages have a license information nowadays. There's like less than 100 packages still left in the queue. Um, and, and your patches are welcome to an help in that direction. Um, another thing we've added is uh, BR2 external. So if you're uh, familiar with the concept of a layer that um, Docto OE um, has, and, and in some extent OpenWRT as well, it's kind of a kind of a simplified form of that. It, it's somewhat simplified compared to what OE Docto is capable of doing, but it, it does help in a number of situations. So basically, BR2 external allows you to point build root to another folder, which contains package definitions and dev configs and other uh, build-related files and artifacts that you need for your build. So in um, companies, it helps um, kind of separating the, the, the open source uh, build roots and open source packages, recipes, and, and make files from your own in-house stuff into two separate locations clearly identified. So some people don't necessarily use that, and they prefer to use Git and maintain branches, so that and, and they use branches to separate their own work from the the, the mainline build root work. Uh, but some people felt it was um, clearer to have really two separate folders, two separate Git repositories. Um, so uh, BR2 external helps in, in doing that. So it's it's available since um, about four years now. And over time, we've improved it to uh, support multiple BR2 externals. So we've got like multiple places where you can put your uh, custom uh, package definitions if you need so. And we've improved it so you can implement bootloader packages or file system image formats into your own kind of um, uh, external tree if you want so. Um, package infrastructures. So um, um, build root factorizes. Uh, a lot of the uh, build logic uh, when your package uses a standardized build system. So if you're using the auto tools or you're using CMake or you're building a Python package, it doesn't make a lot of sense to repeat in, in those hundreds of packages the same configure, make, make install logic with all the variables that you have to pass. So we have those um, uh, package infrastructure that factorize that, that common logic. So we already had AutoTools, CMake, and Python uh, infrastructures, and probably a few more. 
but we've added many, many more over the last uh, few years. So we've extended Python package to support Python 3. Uh, we've added Perl, um, and I'm, I'm kind of skipping intentionally virtual for, for a while. Uh, WAF, Rebar for Erlang packages, uh, kconfig for kconfig based packages, and, and, and a bunch of others. Uh, virtual package allows to create virtual packages, so it's not really a package infrastructure like, like all the others, but it helps us support OpenGL or JPEG or UDEV, those packages that provide an, an, an API, but that potentially has multiple different implementations behind the scenes. So it helps us in, in handling that sort of things. Uh, we've got a kernel module infrastructure to help uh, building packages that build kernel modules. Uh, so it does very little things, but that was repeated in many packages. We kind of factorize that. And, and, and we're adding more, and, and I think uh, on the radar, we have a, a Go, uh, Golang package infrastructure, a Mason uh, package infrastructure, and, and probably a bunch of others that may be coming in the future. Um, uh, graphing, um, so we have um, around the, the, the action of building your system, we also provide a number of tools to analyze what your build looks like. Uh, so we can build uh, graphs about the dependencies of packages, about the time it takes to build your system to analyze uh, how, why your build is so long. Uh, we've added uh, some facilities to um, graph the size of the file system on a per package basis. And um, yeah, so normally it was supposed to be two slides here, but I'm not sure how that shows up here. Uh, and we've added also a way of graphing uh, the reverse dependency of packages. Um, so that's pretty nice to analyze um, wh who is bringing that package into the dependency tree or what, um, why is my root file system so big, which package is contributing uh, this amount of kilobytes or megabytes to my overall root file system, which helps in uh, optimizing the, the, the root file system footprint. Um, on the still in the infrastructure level, we've uh, restructured a little bit the skeleton. Um, so the skeleton is, an, in build root speak, the, the base of the root file system. So it doesn't contain any program or anything compiled, but it's just a basic directory hierarchy, a few init scripts, config files, and stuff like that, that kind of is the, the base of every build root, uh, root file system. And it used to be something like handled in a very special way. And we've changed that to just uh, be a normal package, right? So all the packages that you build depend on that skeleton package. So it's no part of the normal uh, uh, build um, and package dependency logic. And that package is actually um, has actually been split into several sub packages uh, to handle the number, the different init uh, systems that we support. So if we are if you're using um, a CSV based init system or a systemd based init system, you have different skeletons. Um, I mean, if you're using systemd, having init script in etc slash init that dot d doesn't make a lot of sense. <coughs> so we've kind of split that up, uh, factorized the common part in a common package, reorganize all that, all, all those things. So it's uh, um, much better um, supported uh, these days. This allowed us to add support for uh, read-only root file system with systemd, uh, which was not nicely supported until then. Uh, we support the merge slash user, so where user bin and bin and user lib, lib are the same folders, which is also used by systemd. So there's a, a bunch of um, basically better support for uh, systemd-based systems um, um, in, in build root since, uh, since a few years. On the file system side, um, there hasn't been that many uh, I would say major improvements. It's um, mainly minor uh, improvements here and there. Uh, for uh, the XT234 file system formats, we now use mkfs.ext234, which has uh, upstream grown the capability of generating file system images and not just an empty file system on an existing uh, block device. Uh, instead of uh, previously gen ext2fs, which was a little bit limited. We've added support for AXFS, kind of a weird file system, but it's um, it was used by, by some uh, um, build root users. Um, the ISO 9660 file system support has been completely rewritten, and we support Grub2, ISO Linux as bootloaders, and then initramfs, pure ISO 9660 scenario. So all of that has been made more flexible, more extensible. Um, we use more um, extensively a tool called GenImage. So it's done by uh, the guys at Pengatronics, and it's a tool that helps 
uh, automate the process of creating an SD card image composed of multiple partitions containing different file system formats. So you can say with GenImage, okay, I want a, a first partition that is in the um, uh, FAT32 uh, format with those files inside, and then another, another EXT4 partition of that size with those files inside, and yet another EXT4 partition with these, or these other files, and it all generates a, a completely ready to use. Um, so it's a SD card image, but obviously can be used for EMMC as well or any other uh, block device that you, that you want. Uh, and this helps uh, build root producing an SD card image that you can just DD into your EMMC or SD card and, and, and make it completely ready to use. So that's that's pretty nice. And we've up updated a number of our dev configs, so our default configuration that support uh, popular development boards um, to use this um, gen image tool. Um, we have, um, um, the, the way we handle like customization in build root is very often by calling um, scripts at various points of the build so that we don't support in build root itself very funky use cases, but we give the possibility for people who have those funky use cases to plug in their own uh, custom secret source at various points in the build. So we used to have, and we still have a, um, a hook uh, at the end of the build but so when all packages have been built, but before the image is created, and we have a hook at the very end of the build when all images have been created, so you can call any amount of shell script or Python script or Perl script that you want to do your um, secret source. And we've added one inside the fake root environment, so while the image is being built, uh, we use fake root to uh, make uh, build root believe it's root while building the, the root file system image. And you can now call a custom script at that point as well, which allows for more customization. Um, another uh, topic that's been um, uh, not not specific to uh, to build root, but kind of um, a trending in in a number of other build related projects uh, is uh, build re reproducibility. Um, basically, uh, given a, a certain configuration, uh, having the ability to reproduce the exact same build to the the byte level or to the bit level. Um, so you do your build, you hash your uh, file system image and then you do the same build uh, six months later, you have the exact same file system image with the same hash. Um, so we're not there yet. Um, what has been added is the basics. So we've got uh, an option that says, okay, I want my build to be reproducible. Uh, it sets a variable that's observed by GCC and a number of packages to avoid uh, using timestamps, uh, which obviously break the reproducibility of the, of the build. Uh, and a number of other things have been, uh, have been tweaked here and there. Uh, but there are a lot more remains to be done, and, and if, if there's one area where contributions are welcome, that would be uh, one area. Uh, the people who started that effort are no longer really active anymore. Uh, so, yeah, help is, is, is welcome to, uh, to push that further. On the package side, which is obviously where the, the majority of the contributions are made and the, the majority of the activity is, is, is happening, um, it's kind of hard to... Um, Summarize what has happened. We've added more than 1,000 packages in those four years, so lots of things, small and, and not very um, commonly used, to bigger things. But I tried to came up with kind of the big things. So we've added SLNX support, contributed by um, people in the aerospace industry. We've added, um, well, QT5 was already there, but upgraded to 5.9 with uh, many different components. And uh, GTK, EFL has been upgraded, OpenCV, Kodi has been added. Uh, the support for languages has been improved with Go, Mono, and Rust uh, being added. So if you want to use one of those languages on your embedded system, that's possible. We've added gazillions of Python modules, uh, Perl modules, Erlang modules. Um, so lots of people are now using um, not only C and C++, but many more languages, and, and we have support for that in, in build roots. Um, Docker, AUFS, all that um, container technology is also um, being added to build root, and there are still patches pending, adding more of those um, uh, packages. Uh, the system upgrade field is, is also there with uh, solutions like SW update, Rogue. Um, I think we still don't have a package for uh, Mender, but uh, hopefully that uh, someone would contribute that soon. Another area where a lot of work has been done was hardware support. So more and more people have been enabling build root on their platform, editing uh, the corresponding packages to support OpenGL and or other more hardware specific uh, aspects. Uh, PRUs for the uh, BeagleBone platforms or um, other, uh, other uh, aspects. 
And so networking and, and other things have been added as well. So it's really plenty, plenty of packages that have been added. Uh, another aspect where we've done a lot of work um, is uh, everything around, I would say, QA and helping maintaining the, the overall build system into um, a fairly decent uh, shape. Uh, as part of that, we've added a runtime testing infrastructure, so a way to describe test cases and run them under QMU and check that it's uh, running as expected. So that's a very small test here that says, okay, build a configuration that has draw bare, boot it up in, under QMU and verify that the, there is an SSH server running on port 22. Um, and we've added more and more tests, so it's, we still don't have uh, as many tests as we'd like to, but uh, we are adding more and more. And that has helped catch a number of issues. And um, nowadays, for some specific bugs that we get, we add the corresponding test cases to catch the problems in the future. Um, so that's, that's really nice. And, and uh, more and more people are uh, relying on that testing infrastructure to even write uh, changes um, in bit root and, and test them. Um, CI. Um, so we already had a um, CI effort called autobuild.build.org. So basically what we do there is we have a set of 50 architectural toolchain configuration that is kind of fixed. And then um, we pick a random um, of those uh, architectural toolchain configuration, generate a random selection of packages, and build that, and see if it builds or if it doesn't build. And that helps a lot catch um, uh, missing dependencies or a uh, specific combination of packages that have not been handled properly, or, oh, we've upgraded that library, but it's no longer compatible with that other um, package and things like that. So it, this is running 24-7 on multiple build slaves. So we've got, I would say, five, six machines doing that 24-7. And it's amazing the number of problems that this has allowed us to, um, uh, to figure out and fix. And this is still um, running as, we're, as we speak. And um, um, as part of bringing up a new CPU architecture, so looping back on the RISC-V uh, question, um, when we add a new CPU architecture, we do add um, a, con a configuration for that architecture to the system, which means all our 2,000 packages start to be built on that architecture. So if your GCC or Benetil port is not up to speed, uh, you'll get tons and tons of build failures because your um, GCC port is not good enough or your penalty port is not good enough. And, and that's what we expect uh, from people maintaining CPU architecture that will help us fix all those problems. Um, in terms of, imp so that auto build stuff has been, uh, there's been a few improvements, but mainly it's been, uh, it's been the same. Uh, so what we've added is we're testing our dev configs, so uh, that builds uh, minimal systems for a number of popular development boards on GitLab CI, so we make sure they uh, build. Um, the runtime tests that I was describing in the previous slides are also run on GitLab CI. Um, we added uh, the support on autobuild.build.org to support testing multiple branches. Until then, we're just testing the ma master branch of build root. But now we have the ability to also test the uh, long-term support release. So when we make new commits to the uh, maintenance branch, it continues to be tested. Um, and we can figure out if a, a minor update to a package causes any uh, build breakage. And another thing we've added uh, that has helped a lot um, improving the, um, the results is a notification sent to uh, relevant developers whenever there's a package failure. Um, so I'll get to that in the next um, the next slide. So a little bit like the Linux kernel has this maintainers file that says, okay, for this driver, this is the set of people uh, in charge um, uh, for it. Um, we have um, a file called developers, so it's not really maintainers, but it's basically people who care about some part of, um, of build root, some set of packages or some uh, architectures or the documentation or anything like that. And it's used, um, like in the Linux kernel, to send patches. So um, you can look up that file, and we have a small tool that does that for you. You feed it a patch, and it tells you, OK, you should send that patch to this person, that other person, and to the mailing list. But we also use it um, in conjunction with the auto builders. Uh, so whenever there's a failure for a given package, uh, it looks up in that file and says, oh, th this person is uh, uh, likely to be interested in, in being notified about failures on that package, and that person will be notified. So uh, developers in that file will receive every day a summary of the issues that affect either their packages or their architecture, if there's been any failure, of course. 
and that has helped a lot um, uh, to raising the attention of people who were not like actively monitoring the build results, but you know, um, realizing, oh, my package is, has a problem. I, I, it, I can probably spend uh, half an hour looking to that and, and submit the corresponding fixes. Um, we've added a check package script, a little bit like uh, the kernel has check patch to verify your patch. Check package verifies a bunch of very basic and silly rules that we have that your package should look like this to meet the, the coding style. So that also helps in avoiding, um, well, stupid review cycles on the mailing list. Um, we've added the test package script. So uh, it's the output you can see on the uh, bottom right of the slide. It's basically a small script that will uh, build test your package on all the toolchain uh, architecture configuration that we test in the auto builders. So it's kind of going to show you um, how this package is going to uh, break or not the auto builders uh, if it gets merged. So that um, is nice to run uh, before submitting a new package. And we've got some tools. So um, I mentioned in Sky, Scan PyPy, but I should mention Scan CPAN as well. Um, which uh, use uh, respectively um, uh, PyPy for Python or CPAN for Perl and automatically generate uh, the corresponding build root packages. We say scan PyPy and the name of a Python package and it's going to be generating all the build root packages that you need uh, to build that Python package into your build root system. So it's pretty nice, helps uh, maintaining um, uh, build root packages for those uh, uh, interpreted languages. Um, Moving on, on, on other um, miscellaneous improvements, um, the Linux kernel package has been improved um, to support what we call uh, extensions. So it's basically features that require patches to the kernel, things like uh, the Xenomai, RTAI uh, kernel patches. Sometimes specific drivers are not like standalone kernel modules, but they really need to patch the kernel itself. So we have ways to express that things and then probably package those extensions. We've also created a small infrastructure for Linux tools. So it's been a kind of a trend in the kernel uh, over the last uh, five years or so to not only have the kernel itself, but a bunch of user space tools uh, for which the source code is part of the kernel tree itself, uh, which from a packaging point of view means that the kernel tree is not only the kernel anymore, but also a number of user space applications like perf or GPIO or IIO or or other things, and and we've added um, um, mechanisms in build root to to build those user space applications if you need them. Uh, we've reworked the get text handling. Um, that's that's what a fairly big effort there. Not not that useful under for for the final user, but internally it's made a lot of things a lot clearer and solved a number of build issues. Um, We've added checks uh, on the binaries that BuildRoot generates to verify, OK, it's really built for your uh, target architecture, and you, not, you will not build it for the host architecture. And recently, support for hardening feature like um, um, Railroad and Fortify source has been added. And we've got more and more people interested in, in generally security hardening. Uh, the LTS um, effort is part of that, SLNX and Railroad Fortify. So there's, there's a pretty uh, strong. Um, a set of people looking into improving the security uh, at the build system level. So what's coming up next um, on the radar? Um, what do we have? We have a git download cache. So right now, uh, if you fetch uh, a package from a git repository, um, Builder is going to do a clone and then generate the tarball on the side so that if you do uh, the build again with the same um, git repo and, and same version, it's going to reuse the tarball you have locally available so you can do an offline build. But if you change the version of that package, it's going to do a clone again from scratch and re-download everything. So it means that if you're just bumping your kernel version from like one tag to the next tag, uh, every time you do this update, you, you pay the price of a complete uh, git clone, which isn't really nice. So we have patches in, 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 um, uh, well, in, in the backlog uh, that avoid that by having a cache of the Git, um, uh, Git repositories. So you, you only download basically the new Git objects instead of re-downloading everything. Uh, so hopefully that should land at, at some point in the near future, but um, it it's take a while to integrate that kind of uh, core functionality. Um, we're looking into adding per package out of tree build. So right now, when you build packages in build root, um, the source code gets extracted into a folder called output build slash the name of the package dash the version. And we do the build entry. 
So if a package gets built two times, one time for the host, one time for the target, we extract it twice and we build each time to its own uh, source folder. Uh, and also, if you use a feature like local packages or override source there to say my source code is already locally available somewhere else on my system, BuildRoot has to do an rsync of the source code to bring the source code in the tree and build it there, which is a little bit annoying. Um, so we want to uh, bring uh, per package out of tree build. Um, it, in theory, it's not very complicated, um, but that requires a lot of cleanup in different places, so it, it's it's more effort than than you you might um, initially think, but hopefully we'll get we'll get there. Um, another topic I've been working on at the end of uh, last year, and I hope to be back to it in in the next um, few weeks or months, is a top level parallel build. So right now, build root builds in a completely sequential way each and every package. So Inside each package, we use make minus j something to uh, make use of your multiple CPU cores. But each package against each other is, is built sequentially, so we can guarantee that the, the build is reproducible. Um, so we've done, uh, we've I've started doing some work to uh, achieve that the same amount of reproducibility, but even when building packages in parallel. Uh, patches have been posted on the mailing list. Um, people are invited to test them and, and see what it gives in terms of build results. In practice, we have seen a sometimes a, um, um, a two times reduction in the build time in, in most use cases. So it's it's pretty nice uh, to divide your build time by two. Um, and there's also an effort to improve package tooling. Um, so we've um, recently um, so I've contributed a uh, mechanism to uh, track upstream packages using releasemonitoring.org. That is a really great web service that tracks. Uh, upstream projects, I think it's like 16,000 uh, upstream projects. And um, and that allows you to notice, oh, okay, BuzzyBox has made a new release, maybe we need to upgrade our release as well because the new release might have interesting bug fixes or security updates or things like that. So it's, um, it's nice to have uh, some automated way of doing that when you have more than 2,000 packages. And some other folks are looking at tracking CVEs using the NIST database, so in the same kind of direction. Okay, my system is using, I don't know, BuzzyBox 128 or whatever. Um, uh, are, there, is, are there known CVEs affecting uh, this BuzzyBox version? Should I upgrade or should I backport some security fixes? Um, so that's uh, being worked on as well. Um, as I mentioned, new package infrastructures, uh, Go, Meson, and perhaps others will come, but at least for Go, uh, patches have been submitted and Meson, it, it should be done um, in, the, in, in the near future. People are interested in that, in that build system and we're converting um, gradually some packages to, to it. So um, to wrap up, um, um, the project is active, um, still releasing um, uh, every, every three months. We have this uh, new LTS thing, uh, relocatable SDK. Uh, the package set is, is, is um, richer and richer and, and being kept updated and we are adding tooling to keep it even more up to date. Um, the testing effort has been um, significantly uh, increased. It could be improved even further, obviously, but, but it, it's still better than what it was. And I think we have uh, interesting new features on the roadmap. Um, if you're new with BuildRoot and, and you've never used it, there is a tutorial organized as part of the um, Embedded Apprentice uh, Linux Engineer track. I think I got the acronym right, uh, which is going to take place on Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Uh, so it which comes with uh, like practical ends on, um, on on the Pocket Beagle platform. So I think the, the, the seats are sold out for um, uh, actually doing the, the lab with the Pocket Beagle because they don't have eno enough boards. But you can still join the session and, and, and see what people are doing and, and look at the slides and, and things like that if you're, if you're interested in. Um, with that, I think I'm um, done and I have um, uh, apparently a minute and 30 seconds for questions. Questions? Yes, please. If I'm on route of Yucto or a local WRT, so I automatically need to get the latest version of OpenWebRoot. Sorry, can you can you see again? If I'm if the latest version of OpenWRT or the Yucto project, will it also have the latest version of BuildRoot? I'm not sure what the, the question, how the question makes sense. I mean, BuildRoot is an alternative to Yocto or to OpenWRT or to OE, right? So. Okay. So uh, I download, 
download open WRT from the latest Git repository, right? Yes. And we're using Goldberg on open WRT, so is that that the latest? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if uh, either. I'm not understanding your, the question, or you're confusing what build root and open WRT are. So, um, build root is an alternative to open WRT and to OE or to I don't know PTXD or something like that. So you're going to use either or 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 one of these, right? Okay. Right. No, no, no. Okay. Open WRT uh, was uh, very, very a long time ago based on build root. It's a fork of build root, but that dates back from like 15 years or something like that. Um, and nowadays, beside the fact that both of, both of them use uh, cake and fig from the kernel, uh, they have pretty much nothing in common anymore. All right? Um, another question, perhaps? Yes, please. Um, so the, we have this sources.buildroot.net mirror where we keep the tarballs. Uh, we never delete them. Yep. So, so far we have never deleted any file from there. So we've got tarballs that dates back from 10 years ago and for, there's... For, and the second question was for every package? Yes. The only packages where that is not true are packages where you can uh, define an arbitrary version, like the kernel. We can't like mirror every possible kernel version because they are, yeah. But for for the, for all the packages where the version is fixed in the in the package recipe, we have all the tarballs and we run like every I think every day we have a a cron that says okay uh, download the the tarballs for all the packages and 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 we do that every day every day every day and it's it's we never delete them. Uh, no, no. There, there was a question yet, Olaf? Um, it, so the, the reason why we do, um, so the host directory contains the sysroot, right? So um, what we want to avoid is we want to avoid having uh, a package A building, and while it's building, uh, the sysroot of the compiler being modified by adding more libraries, right? So if you have a configure script that runs, and while the configure script runs, at some step you have library A not installed, and then suddenly uh, library A shows up in the sysroot. So you like check if a header is there, it's not, and then you check if the library is there, and then suddenly it's there, right? Um, Right, so if the, in, in the ideal world, if the uh, dependency annotations are correct, you don't need that. But an ideal world doesn't exist, and in practice it's almost impossible to uh, catch all the, the, the optional dependencies that packages are, are, uh, are checking, and, and, and they are changing all the time. I mean, you upgrade to a new version of um, package foo, and the upstream developers will, oh, uh, no, if you have library blah blah on your, uh, on your sysroot, I'm going to use it. And checking all of that when you do we do a version bump is is like unrealistic. So in in the ideal world, yes, but in practice, it, it's really not possible to do that. Question? Are we done? I've got plenty of build root stickers here. Thank thank you for joining. Don't hesitate to come and and pick up as many stickers you want. Thank you.